Hey everyone, welcome. I am going to be sharing uh, how to biblically train up your child. And I want to tell you first and foremost, <laughs> you're not alone and you're not a terrible mom. I think that so many of us have these um, thoughts that other people have it right. <laughs> other people have figured this out. And what's wrong with me? Well, I just want to tell you that you're not a horrible mom and to remember that God is teaching you too. Uh, I love 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, that all scripture is breathed out by God, is profitable or useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, us, right, might be complete, equipped for every good work. So that's the foundation of this talk to remember that we're going to look through four things, teaching, reproof, and correction. So those two are kind of together and then training in righteousness. And I want, um, I wanted to start by sharing some of my epic mom fails. <laughs> First, I just want to let you know, I am a Christian mom. I've been saved for almost, I think it's like nine years this, this coming year. And um, my husband's not saved and my child is not saved. So, you know, he's 14 years old and I don't have everything figured out. But what I do know is I have been obedient to what God has asked me to do. And so we're going to get into some of the details of what I've been doing, um, how I feel like I've had some successes and some failures. So I wanna share with you some epic mom fails to start. Uh, these are embarrassing, yes. Uh, would I go back and change them? No. My training grounds, my personal training grounds was my parenting and it still is. Basically God is training me and you to be more like Jesus. And oftentimes that looks like my kid teaching me <laughs> You know, we often think that some of the things that happen in our world is like, what? You know, because God uses pretty much everything and a lot of times he uses our kids. But that's the goal for all of us to be better Jesus learners and to ultimately be more like Jesus to bring him glory. All right. So I have I have a sin nature that makes me super selfish. So I do the things that serve my selfish desires, right? This is kind of this, this just like our nature. I get tired. I get fed up. I get exhausted. I often feel very underappreciated or unappreciated by everyone in my house. <laughs> Can you relate? Um, my sin nature then manifests itself into yelling, manipulating. Even I've thrown a toy once or twice or 10 times, <laughs> only to have like a hole in the wall. Interestingly for me is the, the hole in the wall often would stay. I would leave that as a reminder of my sin, that I, that showed me a picture of me not controlling, not being, you know, patient and kind and loving. And when I think about that, my inner actions, my outer actions, both of them, are not what God commanded me, right? So it's then that I need to respond by asking God for forgiveness. Um, not only from God though, but from my family too. So my son has heard an apology from me more often than I'd like to admit. <laughs> and, and so I just encourage you to say you're sorry to your child when you blow it model this for them. This, this is what I call the sin forgiveness cycle. And the Holy Spirit has a role in this, which I feel is really profound, but um, he is faithful. He is constantly and consistently and persistently presses. He's pressing hard on my heart as I'm in the middle of this, of the sin right after the sin, if I'm being ornery and I don't repent right away, he still presses on me until I do, until I say I'm sorry, until I really understand what it was that was wrong there, that I absolutely was in the wrong. So, but that's the interesting thing to me because that's where the change happens. Um, it can be humiliating. So after I sin, I, I must apologize. Like it's become almost this 
this game of, man, I'm in the middle of it and I can hear the words coming out of my mouth and I am like, oh, I'm going to have to apologize, <laughs> you know? And I do, I have to right away. And that's an interesting thing because that like is, is a brick on my head, just a, you know, baseball bat to the head saying, Jen, stop it. You know, you have to, you have to change. That's what, that's what asking for forgiveness is. It's not, it's not this cycle of sor sin, sorry, sin, sorry, sin, sorry. No, we have to have a change of mind and a change of heart. And that Holy Spirit in me is doing his work, right? By convicting me, convincing me in my sin so that I can have that change of heart. Um, when I am tired and hungry, <laughs> this is so sad, but it's like the waitress who gets my rage usually. And so now I've made it this rule that whenever I pop off to a waitress, I must immediately say, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, it's just the rule. And my pastor coins it the me monster. And so I just, the me monster will not win. I do not want the me monster to be something that my kid remembers about his mom. I also don't want Jacob to be, become a me monster, which he already is, right? So when we think about the, the daily sin forgiveness cycle, my son sees me sin, and then he sees me repent to anyone or whomever or him all the time. But it's interesting because, you know, he might see me apologize to my husband, apologize to a waitress, apologize to him specifically, my mom, my friends, random people, right? But how do I work then toward training up my child amidst my own sin, right? Because we are, after all, like sinners trying to train up other sinners. We are me monsters trying to help many me monsters. So it's all about this repetition of teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. So I want to get into the reproof and correction. So, so we can kind of get a handle on this. That's the first part is teaching. We have to teach them through not only our example, but in our using our words. But what does reproof and correction look like? Well, I'm going to encourage you to show your child what mercy and grace is. So for instance, is spanking a child, is it biblical? Well, we know that there is discipline listed all throughout the Bible. I just read Proverbs. <laughs> so when I think about um, discipline, I had a, a pastor at one point say that he called a police officer. He had a, a family counseling come in and the, the mom was spanking the child. The father disagreed with it. And he said, aren't we going to get called? Like, can't we go to jail for spanking our children? So the pastor picked up the phone and called the police department like immediately like, while, while they were in the meeting and asked, asked, how do you feel about spanking children? <laughs> and the officer point blank said, it's, I'm all for it. I will tell you right now, the people who are in my prison were never spanked, right? So when we think about, I'm going to give you a few Proverbs here. You can write these down. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Ouch. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And Proverbs 23, 13 through 14, do not withhold discipline, for, discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you shall save his soul from Sheol. Okay, so let me give you an example of how I administer discipline to my child. Um, he's 14 now, so he doesn't get a spanking anymore, but we had the Shabbat, we had the whole thing. Um, spanking in our family was always done a minimum of an hour. Usually it was about an hour after the infraction. Okay, so that was only for me to cool down. There was only one time in his entire life where I spanked him right after the infraction and the kid got lifted off the air in midair and I whooped his butt. And it was because of something big and he knew it 
and he was shocked because he knew this was not the way we ever did this. I had to apologize. Okay, so but that allowed me to cool down, down. And then, and then we would have about 30 to 45 minutes of biblical discussion, really. I had this thing where we would visualize it about the fact that, you know, on, I would take my legs because he was always sitting next to me. And I would say, this is one path down one, like if I had, was going down the path this way, you're going this way. The right path is this way. So the spanking will oop, put you back on the right path. You know, he was very visual and that was the way he learned. And we would talk at length about what he did, why it was wrong. What's the point of correction? What it means for me as a mom to not spank him? What would that look like? Well, that means I don't care. Like if I'm not disciplining, I don't care. So would you rather be disciplined or would you rather just be let off the hook every time? And what was really interesting is by the end of our discussion, he would crawl up on my lap for the spanking ready to go. It was never a struggle. I mean, occasionally as he got older, he kind of got a little ornery about it, but it, he understood that he needed a spanking. So it was interesting. I mean, he hated it and was like, ah, like he was always nervous about it, but he would, he would crawl up on my lap. And it was just an interesting thing because he knew he needed a spanking. So how does God's discipline verify your own salvation? Right? Because I think about it, like, I don't discipline my friends, kids, you know, I might say something, but I would never spank them. I would never give them true discipline uh, because they're not my child. Right. But when I think about God's discipline on us, it verifies the fact that I'm one of his children. Right. So let me tell you a quick story. One day I looked out my window and I saw some kids on the roof of the pool clubhouse. And I was like, what? And I, and I looked closer and I'm like, that's my son. And there was a little kid about three years old up on the roof with them. And these kids were about eight or nine, every, all, all the older boys. And I was horrified and I ran outside and I screamed those kids off that roof and sat every single one of them on our doorstep <laughs> and gave them what for. I mean, the, the horror and terror was clear on their faces because I was explaining to them that one of them could have fallen off and broken an arm. But if that three-year-old had fallen off the roof, he could have died. And I went through the whole thing about what that would look like, uh, you know, if a child died because they were just messing around. Um, he was so little and I, I just was horrifying. So I scurried off the other kids. I said, you go home. And they like ran away. And Jacob sat on the steps, head hanging low, clearly remorseful. He knew it was wrong what they had done. He was verbally and, and physically, everything about him, he was repentant. And I looked at him and said, okay, let's go inside. So in his mind, he knew what was coming next. <laughs> and I said, let's go out for ice cream. We're going to get in the car and go for ice cream. And he was like, what? And I said, okay, I want to teach you what mercy and grace is because you know you deserve to be punished right now. And I can tell 100% that you know that and you, I know that you are sorry for what you did, truly sorry. And what's amazing is I want to share with you what Jesus has done for me. And so I took that opportunity to show him that I'm having mercy on him by not giving him what he deserves. He deserved punishment. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace, in this case, ice cream, is getting what you don't deserve, getting something amazing like heaven that you don't deserve. So that was a really helpful um, tool to use. And I encourage you to, at some point in your disciplinary process, Try to fit in a picture of what mercy and grace looks like. Let them off the hook. You can, you know, obviously it needs to be done at the right time, uh, but make sure it's a good time that they are truly repentant and you can then give them that picture. It's really wild. Okay, so Hebrews 12, one says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later 
It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be, be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as the father, the son in whom he delights. And then Revelations 3 or Revelation 3, 19 says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. So remember, this is all talking to us now, right? And it's a cool thing to give that picture and to grow and learn in discipline with your child. Okay, next up is training. Training, we remember teaching, reproof, correction, and training. It's all about repetition, and that is training. I remember a talk Tiffany gave uh, last year, which was so cool because she talked about all of the like, violin playing and, and how she's terrible now, but she had to practice. And I'm a pianist, and I really don't get good unless I practice. And I, you know, I can't read sheet music. So for me, in order to play anything on Sunday morning, I have to practice my poor husband, right? <laughs> like, why do you mess up all the time? Because I'm practicing and that is what training is. We need to practice. So my question to you is, do you want to hear, well done, good and faithful daughter from God? Don't you also want your child to hear that? Becoming more like Jesus requires training. In training, we use repetition. We do things, we say things, we model things, we correct things, and we do this over and over and over again. That's training. So Proverbs 22, six says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay, I wanna do a little word study. So those of you who are in my Philippian study or taking James with me, we love word studies in there. So we like to get into the Hebrew, into the Greek and figure out what did that word mean back then? So the Hebrew word for even in this case is gom. It's, it represents an emphasis. So it would be more like, instead of saying even when he's old, it would be more like saying, and get this. So they might say, you know, train up a child in the way that he should go. And get this, when he's old, he will not depart from it. So that's um, when we think about that, that it's, we need to be diligent in this. This is not to say that if you train up a child in the way he goes, um, he's going to be saved as a child and then saved older. This is more of a, look, do the work now. And get this, when he's older, he's not going to depart from your teachings. So how do we put this into action then? And I'm all about actionable applications. I'm going to give you some things to do here. So let's dive in. Deuteronomy 6, 7. You shall teach them diligently, your children. Okay. You shall teach them diligently to your children. What? What are we teaching them? You shall talk of them, of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Okay, what are we talking about here? So we need to, we need to really dig into the context of, of what's going on in Deuteronomy here. So let's back up a couple of verses. Verse four says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as sign, a sign on your hand. You shall, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on the, on your gates. Okay. So the Hebrew people of that time, and even today, Jewish um, people today, made this into superstitious behavior. You might have seen like rabbis wearing boxes on their heads and they'd wrap things on their hands and they put things on their doorposts. That was not the intention of this. We have to look at the context. Remember it says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Okay, this was not instruction for them to bind them on their forehead. <laughs> this was instruction to consider that what is frontlets between your eyes? Well, that's, we need to, we need to read the Bible, right? What about our hands? Well, what is, what is it that we see when I'm doing something with my hands, there's action there. 
and how others see me when I'm doing things, they'll see my hands. And when we have to think, what, what are the actions I'm doing? What are the things I'm doing that are allowing it to be bound into my heart? Meaning the Lord, my God is one, and I need to love him with all my heart, soul, and might. So we have to remember um, also that Hebrews understood, you know, the Israel nation really understood the heart was not a gooey feeling. Your heart was everything about you. Your heart was your character and who you are, you are and who you were and who you are going to become. It's who you are. So first and foremost, in order for us to train up our kids, we have to become Jesus learners. We have to be 100% sold out for God. We need to be reading the word. We need to be praying, right? In, in constant prayer, we need to be modeling this behavior. And so when I think about a student versus a teacher, who learns the most? The teacher. The teacher always learns the most. If you want to learn something, then teach it. I am right now in the midst of challenging multiple women to speak like I'm doing right now. And I'm training them. I'm teaching them. I'm training them and wanting them to do it again and again because they're finding out that the simple act of diving into a passage so that they can teach it, man, oh man, the amount of information they learn because they have to teach it, big difference. And you are all teachers and you gotta learn things in order to teach them. So we need to become a Jesus learner. So there's three specific areas that you can model your walk with Christ to your children. This is clearly not exhaustive. And when you get into your discussion groups, you guys will be able to um, consider different areas. Uh, so one of it is you want to consider reading the Bible, right? So Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Are you making it a priority to get in the word? Okay, so when, when do you have time to be alone? As a new mom, it maybe, maybe, a couple minutes while you're going to the bathroom. And even then that's kind of maybe a negotiable, <laughs> but I want you to consider, can you redeem that time? If you teach your kids that when the door is closed, where the, where the potty is, right? The toilet, um, mommy has some alone time. Well, you know, have a book in there. You can have a Bible in there. You can have your phone in there. Um, get on the word, get it, get in the Bible, right? Whenever you can. I also encourage you to try, and this might sound harrowing for some of you, but try to wake up 30 minutes early. Set your alarm 30 minutes early. I did that all through the formative years of my child. And the reason for that was I, I had nothing else. I had no other time. There's just no other time. So I got up early. And the thing about that, God always gave that back to me. I was never exhausted. I never missed that extra time. Um, he would often wake me up at 5 a.m. I called them God appointments because I was like, no, okay, fine. <laughs> so just, he will give you that time back. If you are obedient to that, if you have a God appointment where he wakes you up at 5 a.m., get up. <laughs> okay, I promise you, he will give that time back to you. Listen to the Bible in your car. Easy to do. You know, I think so many of us just get used to turning on worship songs in the car with our little ones. Instead, listen to the Bible. Uh, I love the ESV on YouVersion app. The, the reader, the, the gentleman who reads for the ESV is excellent. So that's something that, you know, think about that. Do worship time, fine, but sprinkle in some listening to the word. Okay, second thing is to pray without ceasing. This is a difficult one for many of us, but I want you to consider 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So can you read? redeem your thoughts. And I will tell you, this takes practice as a mom. Um, we need to learn to guide our thoughts rather than our thoughts to guide us. So that's something that I want you to start considering. How are you waking in the morning, going to sleep at night? Are you, you know, praying over things when you're having a conversation with someone in the, in the back of your mind? Can you be praying, Holy Spirit, guide my conversation here? Can you pray for that person while they're talking? I mean, it's an interesting practice to learn. Um, but also consider keeping a prayer journal with your kids. It's a fun thing to do, and it allows you to look back on prayer to see what's been answered and what's, you know, what you guys have prayed for. The other thing I want you to consider is visual modeling. They are watching your every move. So model your walk with God 
visually to your kids. So, okay, I don't know how many of you tithe online, but stop it. Go get a checkbook that is just for tithing. I mean, we literally use our checkbook just for that purpose. Uh, if he can, he or she can see you writing a check and have them partake in it, say, hey, go put that in the offering plate or in the red box, like at our church. Um, it, it's really a better thing to visually model. Also, when I'm on my phone, I'm not reading the Bible to any of the people around me. I'm just on my phone, even if I'm reading my Bible. So it's important for you to get a hard Bible, have it out on your kitchen table or somewhere where, you know, when I'm doing my Bible studies, I'm downstairs on the kitchen table so that my son can see that mom takes this seriously. She's in the word. She's not just on her phone all the time. So model that walk that, you know, intentionally do things that, that visually they can see. Also intentionally ask for forgiveness of others when your kids are present. Oftentimes I think we wait and we wanna like have that conversation with our spouse or you know, a friend alone um, without the kids. But I think it's more important for us to have those hard conversations in front of our kids so that they can see how are we humbling ourselves to ask for forgiveness? How are we as a parent not always right? You know, how we can ask for forgiveness and um, have a, a conflict conversation that doesn't end in, in conflict, you know? Um, pray out loud in the car. We do this all the time driving Jacob to school is like pray out loud in the car. It's just what we do. Right now, because he's older, we're doing catechisms in the car. And that's something that, you know, as you get older, there's much, a lot of things you can do with your kid. But um, it, when, when they're little, just praying out loud and letting them hear how you pray. Say, hey, I'm going to do my morning prayer right now. Would you guys want to just listen in? Instead of praying as a group and praying like a mommy and a child prayer, let them hear your actual prayer. So it's, it's an interesting thing to do. Now, I want to give you some resources, um, a couple books that I think are really important for new moms, young moms, um, moms of kids under five. Theology is great. It's the ology. Fantastic, even for adults, like seriously a fun book. The Big Picture Story Bible is another one. And then The Big Picture of What God Always Wanted great books. The Action Bible, as they get older, super fun book to have. Um, Bible that's kind of done in, you know, uh, what is it called? Um, I can't remember what they're called, but they're like the little drawings that are um, comic book style. I don't know why that escaped me. Um, and then New City Catechism. That's what we're doing now, uh, but they have it for little kids. So you can start them really young and then get the full set so that you can get into the devotional of it and, and talk it out. And you can even talk it out with your spouse, but then go through that each year. It's a really good thing to do. App resources, the YouVersion Bible app, like I said, the ESV auto, audio is excellent. The Big Picture Interactive Bible Storybook app, very good. Uh, Superbook Kids Bible app, also very good. And then the Bible app for kids, it's really best on iPad. Um, we use that a lot for Jacob. There's so many different things out there. Podcasts are another thing that you might consider doing in the car. Um, one that's great is really cool history for kids. It's like a biblical perspective on history. And then truth seekers, which is Bible stories for kids. So a um, couple questions I just want to ask you that you can discuss. And maybe if you wanted to use this uh, video as a method to how, get into small group discussions. Uh, number one, what stood out to you the most about this talk? And then share how you hope it will impact your parenting. So then you can put this on pause and discuss it when you're grouped. Uh, number two, share a time when you had a mom fail that you turned into a Jesus win. Okay, and then you can pause it, discuss in your groups. Question number three, in what ways is your child or your children teaching you to be more like Jesus? Number four, which action item will you practice this week? I want you to actually write something down that you want to do uh, and, and do it. Number five, share a way that you modeled your walk with Jesus to your kids already. Share something that you already do that you think is good because we learn from each other. So, all right. So that's it. I hope that this has been helpful to you and that you are able to, man, 
train up your child biblically. That's the point. How do we biblically train up our child? And like I said, my son is not saved. I am praying every day that the Lord will get him. <laughs> and I am just doing my job. My job is not to save him. My job is to train him up in the way he shall go, that he should go. So that's it. All right. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you soon. Bye.